Hi, welcome to To Be Revealed with Wendy Watson, where we share spiritual stories about our individual and unique spiritual journeys, what that means for us, and how uniquely different that they can all look. And I create this space so that people can feel safe and comfortable and open to share their stories. There is no judgment here. There's no um, anything like that. So this is a safe space to just say whatever you want to say, share what you want to share, and just tell your particular story. So today we have the amazing Vanessa Raymond, who has traveled from Africa, become a professional performer in Las Vegas and on cruise ships and all kinds of amazing places, has become an entrepreneur of many businesses. And I'm so eager to find out how she finds a balance between being a mother and a wife and an entrepreneur and a friend and a sister and all the amazing all the amazing things while also staying grounded in her faith and just excited to see what her journey looks like. So welcome Vanessa Raymond. Thank you Wendy. Always wonderful to be here with you. Thank you. So the first question I love to ask is what does spirituality mean to you? Spirituality has been a journey. I mean, to me, spirituality itself is a journey in itself because as we age and we experience things in our lives, I think uh, our spirituality also has its own ebbs and flows and influences. And um, as we step away from our home where we grew up, we get uh, other uh, influences other input and then essentially we have to go and sift through all this data and all these things just like many things in life um, we gather all this information and then we have to look at it and go what does that mean to me and what does what do I resonate with and um, for me spirituality is about really being true to yourself and who you are and knowing that what is your truth about religion, the divine, the greater good universe. Um, you know, there's all these different ways to express that word spirituality. And I have explored some of them. I don't feel like I'm at all at the end of my journey or have maybe even gotten all the answers yet do we ever but um I think spirituality is a deeply personal thing and that's also why it's vulnerable to share with people right mm -hmm. yeah yeah but, so I see it awesome I love that and I really appreciate all of my guests including you on being vulnerable and courageous to share such a personal story and such a personal journey live out with the world. So let's start at the beginning. How, what did your upbringing look like? Well, you know, I grew up in a very positive, beautiful, supportive household. Um, very close with my family, my mom and my dad, my brother, there's the four of us. And then my grandmother, who played a huge part in my spiritual journey, uh, who lived with us ever since I could remember. My grandfather died when I was just a little baby. I never got to know him. Um, and my grandmother moved in with us and she was just always there. So she was like my second mother. Um, she was my caretaker, my babysitter, and she was just always there, and my piano teacher. And she had a, a very rich spiritual journey. My father is an interesting man because he's a scientist, you know, he's, he's an electrical engineer. And um, also, but I grew up in a Christian home, right? So we went to church every Sunday. I went to Sunday school every Sunday. Um, and in South Africa, where I'm from originally, white South Africans, majority of us grow up 
Dutch Reformed, which is not very well known in the U.S. as far as I can see. But, you know, it's very traditional, you know, uh, the son, this, the, this Holy Ghost, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and, uh, you know, everything ar- surrounding that. So um, church was very conservative, traditional, you know, you had to wear nice clothes every Saturday, you know, every Sunday, not Saturday, every Sunday when you go to church. And then after the church service, there's Sunday school and all the kids get confirmed um, when they turn 16. I think it's then, then we get confirmed, right? So you get baptized, you go to Sunday school and church, and then you get confirmed. So very traditional kind of standard uh, upbringing as far as Christianity goes. And then, you know, I had my grandmother on the side here who had a very different journey and told me all these amazing stories of things that seemed so dreamy and and amazing and, and wonderful. But I never, as a child, judged or questioned any of it. It was just things, you know, that were coming into my life. So that's kind of how it all began. At the age of about 16 or 17 I got involved with a group and there was like the whole Christian rebirth thing and you know well, that was actually I'm lying that was in college that happened in college and uh, I went through that experience too but that was kind of that seemed now when I look back like a very isolated incident like it was very fleeting it happened it was cool while it happened but for some reason I didn't resonate with the group and I moved on right and then Mm -hmm. I went into a journey of really um really looking more at spirituality uh one of the big turning points in my life spiritually was uh reading um I can't think of the (laughs) book's name oh that's okay Welsh yeah Neil Donald Welsh um of uh you know conversations with God Mm mm-hmm and that book gave me a lot of other different perspectives that had me ask different questions and see different things. So, yeah. And, you know, then all my travels and all the different religions that I managed, that I got to learn about on my travels, uh, you know, but growing up, honestly, I mean, it's kind of naive sounding, but I didn't even like really realize how many Christian denominations are out there, how many other religions are out there. I I grew up very sheltered as far as that goes. Okay. Is there any one of your grandma's stories that you'd like to share with us? Well, you know, it's, it's an ongoing thread because she was just always there. Right. And so, um, she, told me the story that well and you know I I would start asking questions when I got a little older but um, she would always tell me these interesting stories about her astral traveling and um, how confusing it was to her when that started happening to her and she had no clue what was going on and she didn't know what to do with it and of course the church turned her away because they didn't understand it and to them it was taboo right was not uh, accepted in Mm -hmm. the Christian church. And so she went on a journey to find how to deal with this and how to handle it. So she found um, more of the Eastern religions where they do astral travel and they, they do meditate and they do all these things. So she, she found a group called Satsangi and she started going to these, these, um, church services which from what I understand are non-denominational I went with her to many of these and loved it Um, but there she got to learn how to control and how to navigate um, this astral traveling aspect and my favorite stories were the ones where she would tell me how she would go and visit my grandfather right the love of her life and and how she was still so attached to him. Um, You know, so, so that, you know, those are the things that stick with me, but she also had a beautiful book 
that I wish I could find. I don't remember what it was called, but the pictures are still vivid in my mind of all these little souls. They all looked like golden water, you know, drops. And they were going up these stairs and there was the gates, you know, the pearly gates. So as children, we're impressionable and we remember these, mm -hmm. these visions and these pictures. But the thing that, that I remember best is she always told me not to barge in on her, right? Because... Sure. when she was taking a nap or, or sleeping or whatever, if her soul had left her body, then um, that could cause a heart attack if that gets like jarred back, right? So I remember very clearly always walking into her space very softly and gently and making sure she's awake <laughs> when I start talking to her. So yeah, these are the things that stuck with me. And of course, she's no longer around, um, but she was a huge influence on my life. And my dad, the scientist that he is, also very spiritual, took us children to church, wanted us to have a good foundation, but always had very interesting ideas and philosophies about good and bad, Satan and God, and, you know, the, the positive and the negative and, and what's earth and what's heaven. So I remember you know, some of the conversations I had with him and sorry, dad, but some of them I don't really remember because at the time I didn't grasp it. I couldn't really understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, but more recently, uh, the conversations we had have been much more easier for me to digest and understand because I have a better grasp on it now, I feel. Right. So how do, how do you appreciate having both in, like major influences like before we get into the college stuff how being grounded or being having that foundation of both of those two different perspectives what do you appreciate about I really appreciate that I have had exposure and that I can make up my own mind on how I perceive it and what I want to believe and how I feel it is um, something I always said from a very young age when I happened to have conversations with friends about religion or whatever, or even with someone who had very strong convictions about the way they believe. I'd always say to them, I'll never judge you for how you believe. I believe there's many ways to God. There's many routes. There's many ways you can reach that. And it's not the same for everybody. Uh, and that I've always stuck to that. And I think that is partly my view because I have been able to see the different ways that people can reach God. I will never judge anyone for the way um, they choose to take their path to the divine. Yeah, that's awesome, right? Because there's an infinite number. There's how many people are on this planet? There's a trillion people on this planet. Therefore, there's a trillion different relationships with God, spirit, universe, even right. if you're an atheist, you know, whatever it is that you believe in, there's a trillion ways to have a relationship with self and whatever you believe is above and beyond that. Right. So let's expand on your um, college experience a little bit. Oh, okay. If I can remember any of it. <laughs> um, okay. Well, you know, I don't have vivid memory of it, but I just remember going to a Bible study, like I was in college and, you know, I was away from my family and I wasn't really going to church because I was, you know, I was, I was studying musical theater. So on weekends we were rehearsing, we were in the theater, we were, you know, we were always immersed in what we were doing. So I found a Bible study group and I, I went, you know, to a few of these. And then um, I'll tell you what was, the repellent there for me. I think that would be most educational in this situation. Mm -hmm. I was drawn to the group. I was accepted into the group. I, you know, I was told that I was having this rebirth and I was, you know, prayed for and all these beautiful things. And I was like, this is cool. And then, you know, I had a conversation with someone about some issues that I was having with my vocal cords at the time. I was having surgery. I was I had nodules and all this stuff going on with my voice. And of course, at the time, my voice was my career. So that was very important to me. And that person told me that it was something to do with my grandmother, that I was dealing with these 
focal issues. And at the time, that was not a consideration for me at all. I'm like, mm-hmm. I just felt like it was just something they they said because it sounded like it might make sense and maybe it did, but it felt like an accusation that, you know, I need to, I need to cut tethers with my grandmother and that's why my voice is having issues. So that completely pushed me away. I was like, okay, I'm done with this. Yeah. It was kind of narrow minded to me. And I felt like maybe because they had a sense of her spiritual beliefs and the way she, you know, found her divine, um, that that wasn't acceptable in the group. And I'm, I'm really, really attached to her. She's, you know, she's been my other mother, my other huge influence in my life. So that just kind of turned me off completely. And I just left. Yeah. That was- that was okay. a big argument or nothing. I was just like, okay, that's how you feel. That's okay. I'm walking my path. I'm going on the next journey, next chapter of this journey, right? Yes. So yeah. what was the next major influent, influential experience? That would be conversations with God. Because um, I picked up that book and I felt like, oh my gosh, right here, (laughs) here are so many of the confirmations of things that I have um, felt in my heart and in my soul. And I just resonated with it, you know, and I'm not saying that book is the be all and the end all. And there's three of them. I read all three of them. The first one was definitely um, the one that made the most impact on me. Um, And then I remember handing the book to my dad And he was, he loved it. He was dumbfounded. He was like, okay, this is cool. This is great. You know, so him and my mom ended up following a lot of, uh, of the author, Neil Donald Welsh's um, philosophies and, and also met him and went to some of his events when he came to, went to South Africa and, you know, um, but of course, you know, and, and for them too, that was just another thing that kind of was something that they resonated with. And so that, that for me, and, you know, then honestly, I'll say after that, once I started traveling a lot, I really have not been to church much, honestly. I mean, Mm -hmm. Christmas Eve, Easter, you know, the religious holidays, I'll go to church with my family. Um, But in the years that I was traveling on the cruise ships, they'd have services. I'd go to service now and again, Um, But from there on, really, it was me and I still I still believe this firmly. I believe that, you know, God is omnipresent. He's always with us. And no matter what we do, we don't have to be in church to be, you know, to be devout or to or to be accepted or to be um, we our everyday actions. And we I speak to God all day. Right. Mm -hmm. we we throw out comments and we pray every minute of every day when we wish for things, we set goals, we, we thrive, we, we, um, we create habits, we do all these things to better our lives and ourselves. And to me, that's all part of spirituality and all part of being in touch. And, and then, you know, occasionally we'll go on a walk or we'll smell the roses or we'll, you know, we'll, we'll taste something and we'll go, Oh, this is divine. Right. And I believe that all of that, plus the money we're making, the people we're helping, all of that is spiritual, all of that as part of who we are as spiritual beings and how we manifest in this world. And for me, it's just always been about, you know, what is what what is a good person and how can I be the best that good person that I can be and to me that's like church (laughs) you know (laughs) yeah for sure so you say that you talk to God on a regular basis on a daily basis Mm -hmm. what does God sound like or feel like to you just a calmness you know when people talk about faith it's really about just knowing that whatever it is that happens it might not seem like the best thing right now but in the end in the long run whatever it is that happens it is what's best for me in the moment right Mm -hmm. there's a lesson to be learned or there's there's uh, 
you know, a, a moment of happiness or a moment of peace, or there's turmoil, but maybe the turmoil is there because there's something I need to learn. There's mm -hmm. something I need to do to grow. And so, you know, it's really just being in the moment and accepting things for what they are. And I'm not a person that overanalyzes either. I'm not a person that asks too many questions. My grandmother always said, you know, believe like a child. Why not? <laughs> You know, so sometimes yeah. I have a childish kind of faith, like just, yeah. hey, you know what? It's going to be okay. Yeah. And, um, so it's more like an internal calmness. So when you speak, when when God responds, he responds or she responds in just like an internal calmness. And you just know that that's your connection. Yeah, I just believe that it's that it's it's there. You know, I, 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 sure, I've had my own turmoils and my, my own times of anxiety and my own times of stress. We all have that, right? Mm -hmm. It's never not going to be there, but it's about how you look at it, how you perceive it, and having faith that it's there for a reason. Now, what do we do to take action? Um, it could be a prayer. It could be... <laughs> you know what, go do that thing, go, go take that leap of faith, you know, go jump. When, when I moved to Colorado to start my new life with my new family, it was a leap of faith. I had no idea what I was stepping into. I had to just believe that this is what is meant to be for me. And if it's not, then I'll have to change direction sometime, somewhere along the way. But if we don't have a belief or a faith bless you if we don't have a belief or a faith in something bigger than us then life loses a lot of meaning i feel and mm -hmm. uh, you know i mean that's just how i feel yeah so from college now you have a family right yeah. you ended up in vegas and you met your new husband in a bar, your now husband yes. in a bar. Yes. And you were kind of in a place where you were struggling. Oh, yeah. That was probably the roughest time of my life. Like, you know, aside from dealing with the stuff that that I dealt with in college regarding my my voice and my fears about being able to do what I love and being passionate, that was hard, but that wasn't nearly as hard as um, going through my divorce. Because my first husband, uh, you know, I met on a cruise ship and we spent um, a lot of time together. And, you know, it was, it was all I had in my life at that time. It was kind of my be all and my end all. My family was in South Africa. He was an only child. We didn't really have much in the way of family. We didn't have children yet or anything. Um, so I, you know, my whole life, my whole life revolved around that relationship, which was part of the problem. Um, part of why it didn't <laughs> really work out. Um, and it, it, you know, while it was, we never ever step into a relationship like that or a marriage like that without thinking it's going to last forever. Right. And so then mm -hmm. when it doesn't, there are a lot, there's a lot of turmoil and there are a lot of questions that come up. So, you know, I thought this was going to last forever. What happened, you know? And um, when I met my current husband at that bar, you know, the story, cause I tell it when I speak, um, it was like a, another door had just opened and, yeah. and all the other stuff started looking clearer and I could understand what the lesson there was. And there were definitely lessons there. <laughs> you know? um, but yeah, at that time I was living in um, a friend's home who was my business partner as well at the time who just had a newborn baby. I was sleeping on an air mattress at mattress in the middle of winter. And some of you know what that feels like. It's freezing because uh, those things don't get warm. And I just remember being ice cold at night thinking, okay, what the heck am I doing with my life? Am I flying back to South Africa or am I trying to do this thing here in this country? And to get through times like that, if you don't have positivity in your life, which I believe spirituality and faith is 
probably 99% of that, um, it's really hard to get through. It's really hard to look at that and go, okay, how is this going to get better? And, you know, why am I here? <laughs> right. So what tips do you have in order to use your faith, your spirituality in order to get through times like that? Again, sometimes we have to just surrender and we have to just go, don't ask too many questions because the answers will come. There's no way we'll get the answers to those questions in the moment. It's not meant to be like that. Not always. Sometimes, maybe. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, maybe some of the questions will come. But we might... There's a quote out there and I don't know who said it, but my dad said this to me once and it stuck with me forever. And he said, remember that in the end, everything is always going to be okay. And if it's not okay, it's not the end. I okay. love that. So I've always kind of hung on to that and went, okay, well, things aren't okay. So this cannot be the end, right? <laughs> um, and, and again, it's that naivety, that naive childish type of faith. And of course, I, I credit a lot to my parents because I grew up in a very positive environment. Like my mom is one of the strongest women you'll know. Her dad was a full on alcoholic. She, you know, she was the oldest of three girls. Her mom was always working. She was a nurse. You know, she had a rough life, but she's the most positive, strongest, most grounded, logical human being I know. So I've always had that too, you know, and having that person in my life, I think was huge. And then my dad, he's like my teddy bear. He's like my comforter, like my person that Whenever anything is wrong, I he can just hug me and everything's okay, right? So I had that too. And I will say that that's a big part of why I've been able to be the positive human being that I am because I have had the support. But they also raised me to be my own person, to stand on my own two feet. My parents were very strict. I mean, there was a lot of rules. And um I believe that that stability and then also being grounded in faith, being grounded in and, and with all their different beliefs too, they make sure that as children, we had a good foundation as far as what's God, who's Jesus, you know, what are all these things people are talking about, but then what's beyond that? Yeah. So now you're married quite some time. Yeah. And a couple of kids. So how do you use your spirituality and your faith with your family and balancing, like trying to provide that same foundation for your children? It's not always easy. You know, life is tumultuous. And when you're dealing with different personalities and, and uh, people who are as a family unit, you are so close and there's so much love, but there's also the arguments, the different perspectives, the different, the, all that stuff. To me, the way I see it is it's always been about letting each person be who they are, giving them um, as much love and support as possible. And of course, you know, we have two in college, so they're at an age where they have to figure it out. So you can't try and um, you can't try and rule their lives by trying to tell them at that age what they need to be. But I have my 10 year old who, again, I'll be honest, I've had some feelings of guilt because we don't go to church much, but we do. We take him to the, you know, to the Christmas service and the Easter service. And, you know, his dad is Catholic, so you know, I don't have my church here. So we go to Catholic church and that's fine. I mean, it's another place of God. I'm all good with that. I don't care which denomination it is. It's the same God. Right. So, and since Levi was a little baby, I would read from the children's Bible for him. And we would talk about Bible stories. And actually my child, I wish I followed my mom's advice and written down these things because I don't remember them, but he has made some amazing 
comments as a little young child, which I was like, this is a little old soul. He gets it. He understands. He's had, he had the most in-depth, amazing questions as like a five-year-old about evil and good and Satan and God that I could have never imagined that a five-year-old would utter. And if you ask me what they were now, I'm sorry, I can't tell you. <laughs> but I can tell you that in the moment, I gave them the best answers I could, but I also had a sense of, okay, this child, he's an old soul. Like he's been there, done that, he gets it, yeah. right? Yeah. So I have put faith in that and the and the good upbringing that we're giving him as good people in our lives and as sharers and givers and that he will be able to carry that into his life. I think being an example is everything. Um, yeah. And so, yes, yeah, sure. Um, you know, I've said, I've said to my husband, oh, maybe we should take him to Sunday school. We should do this. We should do that. Our lifestyle has not been 100% conducive to that, but we do do, um, education at home and I do have whenever we're in the car driving somewhere to soccer practice whatever we do have the conversations we talk about these things and I think that's what's important is for him to just have the grounding the foundation and have the knowledge and the relationship knowing that he can come to us and ask us questions about it anytime and if we don't have the questions we will find someone for him with some questions right and then yeah. For me, it's important that my children can look at it and have the big picture like I did and be able to make up their own minds how they're going to walk their path. And of course, we encourage them for it to be a good path and a, to be good people and to do good things. And to me, that's um, part a huge part of spirituality. Yeah. But also having that connection with the divine and understanding. You know, when Levi's grandmother died, Mimi's with Jesus, Mimi's with God, right? That's what we teach him. Sadly, most recently, his little gecko died. Gecko's with Mimi, right? So yeah. it was it was heartbreaking. He cried so hard and oh. I broke my heart, but it was so um, beautiful yeah. to hear him say, yeah, you know, charcoals with Mimi. So, you know, yeah. and that, uh, so I know he gets it. Yeah, I love that. So now you're an entrepreneur. You've transformed from performer to multiple entrepreneurs. Right? Yes. Multiple yes. Multiple businesses. Yes. How did that transition look like? Very organic. Like not something I would have ever imagined. If you told me 10 years ago I was going to be sitting where I'm now, I would have told you you're crazy. <laughs> right. There's no way. Right. There's no way because um, I'm an artist. All I ever wanted to do was perform and dance. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I was a, I got my beauty technology license. You know, I'm a massage therapist. I, I'm a personal trainer. I do all the things. But what I didn't realize is I was always a little bit of an entrepreneur. I just didn't know that was what it was called. Right. Mm -hmm. I was being an entrepreneur. I when I was in college and I had just, you know, I finished, I graduated as a musical theater student and I was performing full time and I was getting my license as a beautician, which in South Africa, that's really an esthetician, not a, okay. here it's someone that does, it's, I did everything but hair, right? Okay. Facial manicures, pedicures, or waxing, all things. Um, I had my own little business. I, I had all my stuff and I do in-home treatments, right? And but I didn't think of it as a business. It was just because I loved it. And I loved doing facials and doing girls nails. And, you know, I just loved it. So I just did it, right? I didn't think of it as running a business. Um, plus my mom was an entrepreneur. So I grew up with a mom who owned her. My dad started the business. My mom took it over. My dad turned out not to be a very good entrepreneur. Um, <laughs> he's really good at what he does, but running business wasn't his thing. So my mom took it over and she's run with it. She's 78 now and she still runs her business. I love it. So I have that in my family. I have that in my background. So, you know, it does make total sense. Uh, but meeting Rob, joining Achieve, that was 
the pivot point for me. I started my own business um, in Vegas. I started a fitness business with a friend, this partner that I was living with at that time when my story came to fruition. Um, but again, I didn't think of it as running a business at the time. We started our business, but we were training people because we loved it, right? We loved training people and making them feel better in their bodies. And um, that was just something I did. And so when I started to realize, hey, I got to figure this thing out because it's not working. I'm not really making any money. I'm just, you know, make getting by. That's when I looked around and I found Achieve. I found Rob. And um, yeah, that's where it all began. He's really who transformed me into an entrepreneur, someone who can call themselves a full-on entrepreneur. And, and on this journey since 2008, when I joined, um, I have had multiple businesses. I have created multiple pieces of education at all the things that we are all doing now. And still sometimes I'm like, really? Am I, I'm an entrepreneur. That's what I am. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> I'm a speaker, I'm a performer, I'll always be a dancer. That's something that's in my blood. No, I don't go to classes anymore at the moment, but I will get back to it. You and I talked about that. Um, yep. But, you know, I feel like all of it is just divine intervention. And it's just me living day by day. Yes, having those big goals and, and sit, putting the plans in place to make them happen. But if you don't have an intrinsic sense that there's bigger out there, there's someone taking care of you no matter what, it's hard. It's hard to, all this stuff, being an entrepreneur is challenging. It's not an easy thing. You know this. Yes. Um, so without faith, without spirituality, it makes it a lot harder, I think. So how do you find your balance between wife and mom and mentor and entrepreneur and all the different roles that you as a unique person have, how do you find the balance? And do you have a morning routine? Do you have specific tools or things that you use yeah. in order to help find your balance and help bring that piece in when you need it? Well, while we're being vulnerable, let me just say, it's not always that way, right? Mm -hmm. The balance isn't always there. Yep. Sometimes I, it's overwhelming. Sometimes things go haywire here too, right? However, yes, I, um, I think it's very important to take it one thing at a time, right? If, mm -hmm. if I was trying to tackle everything at once, no, you, nobody right. can do that, right? Nobody can do that. Um, sure, I've had mommy guilt, because I work 10, 16 hour days, but I've brought my child along on the journey, right? Mm -hmm. He goes to the meetings with me. When he was little, he'd come to Starbucks with me and he'd hang out, he'd color in his books and I'll be in my meetings. And, you know, as mothers, I think gratefully and gladly in the entrepreneurial world as women who, who also deal with other women entrepreneurs we all get it right like I no one looked at me and went why is your child at our meeting right they get it you're a mother you're so I think it's very important as parents for us to not think we need to cater to our children because they are adaptable and everything is a learning experience for them I think once we start catering to them is when things start getting too much because a child has its own will. It's always going to want its own thing. It's always going to want to be the priority, right? You have to teach the child that life doesn't cater to you. You have to adapt. That's what life's about. So that's how I raised my son. And that's why I am so grateful. He is, and we flew in last night. We had a delayed flight. Okay. Yeah. We didn't get on the plane so what was it? Uh, Eight fifty-seven in California. So that's nine fifty-seven here. We didn't land till almost midnight. We stood outside waiting for an Uber for over an hour. We didn't get home till two a.m. My child was good with it all, right? Because I had he slept on the plane. 
you know, we were joking around. We were cold while waiting for the Uber, but we ran inside and came back out and ran inside. We warmed up, we came back out, <laughs> made games out of it. He, you know, in the Uber, he fell asleep. I raised him that way. Like, you know, you adapt to life. Mm -hmm. The moment we start trying to, to change our lives, and my brother actually told me this, and I'll forever be grateful to him. He always said to me, he said, a child is a child. You teach them what they need to know. You don't give them what they want all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where a lot of people struggle because um, children, my mom said to me once, all they need is love and a full tummy and a roof over their head, right? Everything else is life and they learn through everything. And so that's really how we raised our children, all our children, children the girls too. Um, they, you know, will always have a want and a need and we will accommodate where we can, but you don't compromise your life because the income that I am earning, that is giving my child college and a good life. Yeah right? It's buying him the little things he wants when he wants them. It's, you know, by no means does he get everything he wants either. Um, but I think it's, it's really important to understand my parents were working parents. I never felt like I was being neglected. I had everything I wanted. And one of the stories I love to tell, I don't know how much time we have left here, but um, it's a quick story. And I will never, ever forget this. I remember my mom and dad sitting us down. I must have been about five or six years old. My brother was three years older than me. And my mom sat us down and she said, you know, mommy goes to work every day and daddy goes to work every day. Um, if you could choose, and I guess she was thinking about quitting her job, right? That was what that was. I didn't realize it in the time, but she just said to us, if you could choose between mommy being home with you every day and hanging out with you and playing with you and doing things with you or mommy and daddy being able to buy you everything that you need and want, which one would you rather have? And which one did we pick as children? We'd rather have you buy us everything we want. <laughs> because you know why when my parents came home from work at night, we ate dinner as a family. We watched TV together. There was quality time. Mm -hmm. There was love. There was and everything else, right? So I never felt like I got compromised or anything got compromised or time got taken away from me because my parents worked. And it's a personal choice. I'm not saying it's wrong to stay home and be with your children, do that if you can, by all means do it, right? But my experience as a working person who likes to work, a person who loves to be busy, a person who loves to care and share with others and teach and do all these things, the time with my child at home, if I was with him for too long, it became, it became, um, we were butting heads because neither of us were happy, right? I, I didn't want to be there. I wanted to be doing other things. Not like I didn't want to be with my child, but when you're with anyone 24 seven, it's too much. Nobody can handle that, right? I mean, if they, that's not balanced to me. Yeah. yeah. So, I felt in my life, and again, I'm not judging anyone, it's a personal choice. Yeah. But to me, I'd rather be out doing what fulfills me and my heart so that when I come home to my child, I'm all his. And I'm not wishing I was doing something else or being with someone else or doing, so I have it all, right? So what is your balance? So you asked for a tip. My tip is find out what is your balance because if you're not happy, you're not gonna make your child happy. There's no way you're going to be miserable. You're going to be arguing with your child all the time. Right? Well, and you're not going to be happy. No, because but that's the point. I mean, yeah. we have to be fulfilled as human beings to be able to give those around us what they need. Bingo. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, and again, it's a personal thing. If being home mm -hmm. with your children is what fulfills your heart and what makes you and them happy, wonderful. That's just not who I am. Me, I went back to work three weeks. I had three weeks. I had six weeks maternity leave. Three weeks into that, I was like, I, I got to get out of this. I, I cannot do this. I got to get doing things, right? I got to yeah. write education, teach some classes, work with some people, um, go to some networking events. I took my child to his first restaurant bar when he was a week old because <laughs> I'm being in the house. I'm like, I can't do this. At the same time, 
I'm a homebody. I love being home. I love hanging out. But again, it's that balance, right? Yeah. So finding the balance between how much time you want to spend at home alone, how much time you want to spend at home with your family, fulfilling all the other tanks that you have, your entrepreneurial tanks, your fitness tanks, right? Because I know you're a very physical person, right? So getting yes, your workouts in and getting your dance I'm in. I'm not doing and those things. I'm miserable, right? So yes, and that's not always going to be the way we want it. No. But if we know what we want and we can work on a plan to make it happen majority of the time, then that is the ideal. Um you know, I, I still have to do things that I don't always isn't 100% ideal, but that's life, right? Yeah. We handle it, we deal with it, we do it. And then we take steps to make things be the way we want them. Yes. So you have gone, you have experienced happy, loving homes. You have experienced a home that maybe was less loving and happy. You have experienced being in abundance and you have experienced being in lack of abundance. How, what tips or what can you provide our audience in being able to navigate those different waters or transition from the happy home to not so happy to back to happy to having money and not having money back to having money like yes. what are what are some tips or or goodies or little nuggets that you can provide our audience for different transitions? Yes. Um, okay. So my number one thing I would say is know that nothing is forever. Okay. Change is ever happening always. So when things are tough and it's in the same vein that I was talking about earlier, it's important to remember that every day is a new day and every day can hold new promises, but we can't sit on our laurels and think, oh, God's going to provide for us, right? Because he will, but not if we don't make a plan and we don't take steps and we don't do the things. I say God, but you know what I mean? Yeah. The universe, whatever, whatever it is you believe, I'm all good with that. Um, you have to be in action. Because what happens when we get really low is we step out of action. We retreat and we curl up in a ball and we just freeze. And that is that, that time of ambivalence is when I experienced my most anxiety, my most stress. And, you know, the doctor wanted to put me, I've, I've never had depression or anxiety in my life. And there I was, I didn't know what to do with all this. And my mom's like, go see the doctor. And they gave me a Valium. And I'm like, I took one and I was like, ah, can't do this. Life slowed down so much for me and everything was in slow motion and it drove me crazy. I threw them all down the toilet and I was like, okay, what actions can I take? What steps, you know, what's, but you don't have to look way ahead. Just what is the next thing? What can I do today to make my day better, right? It could be very simple. And what I always say to my clients and my people that I work with on confidence and self-image and all these things that I work on with is, it's when you have that feeling of freeze and inaction, when you have to make the most effort to do something, whether it means taking a shower or brushing your hair, because the simplest things can pull us out of feeling like crap, right? Mm -hmm. It's okay to wallow for a minute, right? <laughs> we'll have to go through the grieving process. It's okay to grieve, but you cannot stay there. Nobody can, you'll die there. Yep. Okay, so if you have, if I can give you any piece of advice, it's do something, you know, get out of bed and go take a walk. If you don't feel like brushing your hair or showering, don't just walk, right? Or if you don't wanna go out and see people, but human connection is the second thing, right? So number one is take action, do something. Do something that takes the, takes you forward, take physical action, right? Mm -hmm. And number two, 
is human connection. Who can you reach out to that you trust or that you can just have a conversation with that without them judging you? Know who those people in your lives are. Sometimes it's not, we don't want advice. Sometimes we just need someone to like rant to, but also guard against ranting too much because that's something I did too. Like for a while, I was telling everybody all my laundry and my garbage. And after a while, people don't want to hear it anymore. They're sick and tired of it, right? They don't want to know. Like they want you to be happy, but uh, they can only handle so much of that. So again, you have to... You have to step back and you have to step almost outside of yourself and go, okay, what are the actions I can take? And then number three, and maybe this one should have been first, but do do find what, what promotes faith in your life? What promotes inner peace in your life? What, what is it? Is it going outside and sitting under a tree or is it um, going in, in a, like I said yesterday, I said a, bubble bath with candles right could be something really simple or maybe there's a workshop a free workshop online you can take that is about stress or relieving stress or a breathing exercise or go on youtube and find a guided meditation don't be it don't be passive get into action mode to me that's the one number one tip and when i say action mode it counts for everything it counts for the spiritual action the mindset action the physical action but to me who's a very physical person to me the physical action spurts on the other things it gets me rolling gets me going so once I get going the other things kind of is easier to work with and for some it might be the spiritual first or the mindset first right for me the physical thing that workout that getting out of bed and I don't know, the whatever, adrenaline rush. a little yoga or whatever, or just brushing my hair and taking a shower. That's what gives me energy and gets me rolling. It gets me going. Awesome. All right. One last question and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah, I got another thing I got to do. So that's yeah. perfect. <laughs> okay. Gotta go teach. Um, class now, so. <laughs> for busy working entrepreneurial moms who sometimes have that mom guilt who some, you know, go through the emotional fluctuations of, I'm so happy I'm providing all of these amazing opportunities and experiences for my child. But then I, you know, on the occasion feel like I'm not giving them enough quality time. What advice, what spiritual tools would you give them? You know, (sighs) I don't think the amount of time you spend with your children is as important as the quality of the time that you spend with them. And if you can do things with them, yeah, you know, one of the things, and and you know, and again, I'm being very transparent here and I love you, Leah. Leah is Levi's uh, auntie, right? She takes care of him a lot and he gets to do all the fun things with her because mommy's always working, right? But when we're together, when him and I are in the car driving somewhere, or I just got home from work, I take those five minutes or those 10 minutes to have a meaningful interaction with him, whatever that might look like, whether it's playing a game or whether it's talking about something a little more serious or asking him a question that invokes some kind of um, thought on his part about whatever whether it is relationships or religion or um you know but but just when you are with your children that's what they'll remember they're not going to remember that and and you know they're they're happy on their own they play they do their thing they run around with their friends they do all these things they're happy they need you to be happy because that is what directly feeds them Mm -hmm. is seeing you happy and seeing you in a happy relationship with their dad or your significant other or whatever. It's being that example that those are the things they're going to remember. Um, You know, and, and I know, I know the feeling, like I said, uh, Leah and the, the girls, Nicole and Rachel, his sisters, they're always taking him to do fun things. They go to the game, they go to the, but we make a point that when we're on vacation, we just took him to the LA Lakers game, right? We do things that he's going to remember. So when you are together, do the memorable things. It doesn't have to be extravagant. 
you know, it can be simple, but don't beat yourself up because you know what? You're beating yourself up and your child doesn't, they don't know. They're just happy when they can spend time with you. So make that time worth it. I love that. That's amazing. Well, thank you for all of your amazing stories. And again, being vulnerable and courageous to share your stories and um, some of your experiences that you've been through and how we can help uplift each other to find our own unique stories, to find our own unique tools and tips on how to up-level ourselves, our spirituality, and find that balance in our lives. So thank you so much. I appreciate well, you. Well, and, thank you for um, having me here. This was really lovely. It was so lovely to share. It's not something I talk about much, you know, so it felt good. Yeah, yeah. awesome. Well, for our audience, please, I'm going to post this in a little bit. So please check it out, like, comment um, on our story. What is What was your biggest takeaway from Vanessa's story? Was it her um, intercontinental journey? Was it, you know, how she's uh, changed through her relationships? Is it the depth of her uh, faith or is it, how she has found a balance between all the different roles that she plays in her life. So share your thoughts. We look forward to it and see us in three weeks when we have Leela Veronica share her spiritual story.